Quick update on my mother-in-law, her recovery from the motorcycle accident and brain injury that she suffered. Uh, please continue to pray for her. She's doing well. Uh, our prayer request this week is that she would get the brain-specific physical therapy that she needs uh, in the coming weeks ahead so she can keep progressing. You know, in, in recovery, you kind of get to a point where you need some extra help to get a little further. And so that's what we're praying for her. Uh, for those who prayed for me this last week, because I had uh, my monthly cancer infusion, that was on Wednesday. Thank you so much for praying. Um, it went fairly well. I always have to look at Jen to see if it did go well, because I'm always painting the rosy picture. Yeah, it's great. And she sees me at home when it's not. Um, so it was, it was fairly good. Nothing um, real significant. Something we're waiting on. They did a very specific blood test that's kind of a progress report that's going to tell me where I'm really at in treatment. So that's kind of a cool thing. You kind of want to know where you're at and how much more to expect. So the plan is 24 months. I'm six months in, so 25% of the way done. Uh, but it could end up being less if certain blood work comes back favorable. So I would love for it to be less, <laughs> but I will take it as long as I need it. Amen. So, but thank you guys for praying. Glad to be here. Why don't we pray and ask God's blessing on our time. Heavenly Father, we now come before you and Father, we recognize our deep need of you. Lord, even when it comes to reading your word, we need your Holy Spirit to give us understanding into these things, Lord, not just to re receive and read facts, but understand divine truths communicated to us by you. And by your Holy Spirit. So Lord help us to understand that which we read today. And not only understand it. But may you apply it to our very souls. May it change us Lord. And fashion us more into your image. And Lord I pray that you would give to your people today. A new hope. A living hope. Because our Savior is living. We thank you Lord for this letter of 1 Peter. May it continue to bring you glory. As we study it together. In Jesus name. Amen. Now the... Star Wars fan that I am couldn't resist <laughs> a slide like this. Thank you, Tom, for doing it. If you've watched any of the movies, the first movie ever made is Star Wars 4, which is started number four, which is weird, A New Hope. Now, I will add the disclaimer. I'm a Star Wars fan, not a Star Wars nerd, okay? I'm the generation that grew up with it and possibly saw it in the theaters, but I didn't dress up to see the more recent <laughs> reboots, right? The, I didn't go in costume to the movies. If you did, that's your thing. That's not mine. I buy my kids lightsabers and all that, so that's the generation I am. But it's interesting that the first movie leads off with that title, A New Hope. Uh, because there were challenges in this storyline and this universe that is fictitious. But there are challenges in this universe, is there not? Yeah. And maybe your week was like mine. I had some challenges before me. But they were little challenges for me. And some people I know were going through horrific battles this last week. Things that are life-altering and life-shattering for some. And you see, it started Monday night. I was getting ready to train in the church gym here with my kids and uh, beat them up a little bit and have some fun. And they, they get to beat me up. And, and I got a phone call from a member in the church letting me know about a situation I wasn't aware of yet. And that was the birth of a little baby girl named Ziva at 24 weeks old. And the, the family, grandparents go to our church and I got contacted because I was told little baby Ziva was not doing well. And so I went to the hospital to be with mom and dad, Andy and Angela, and see little baby Ziva in the NICU. And she was a whopping one pounds, two ounces. And this little miracle girl needed a lot of prayer. So many of you got that prayer request that I sent out uh, to pray for her. And then we continued to pray for her throughout the week. And I was in touch with the dad. And then Wednesday came and I kind of had to shift focus because it was infusion day for me. So my family and I had to gear up for it. It's always a different experience and a different day. And so we went through the day. Everything went off without a hitch. I 
Two days later, I always forget. The second day after infusion, I feel pretty crummy. And then it lasts for three, four days. Um, and so it hit me on Friday. I was not feeling well. Some on Saturday. Saturday morning, I woke up. And the day started with a text that little baby Ziva went home to be with the Lord. And so, you know, messaging and, and with the family and praying for them. And then little did I know later yesterday throughout the day, I would get two more notifications of ladies attached to this church in some way who passed away. And so it was a pretty interesting day. And while I was driving my truck, running around, getting stuff done, and I got the notification about one of them, right when I was told on my radio came these words, my chains are gone, I've been set free. My God, my Savior has ransomed me. And like a flood, his mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. And this lady who I heard about, who I know and love, knows and loves Jesus. And I know that that was absolutely clear of her life, that her chains are gone. She's been set free from the shackles of this life, and she's in the unending love of Christ. The reality is, is that is true of all three of these daughters of the king. One was only a few days old. One was several decades old. And the third that I heard about was almost a century old. And what you have in one 24-hour period is three different daughters of God being called home to be with him of varying ages. And the truth we see in that is it doesn't matter what age you are presently. Death is a reality that comes to us all at some point. And we need to know how to face it and know the one who overcame it for us. That we need to have hope in the midst of death's reality. And so in a situation where many are hopeless or they couldn't fathom enduring the loss of a child like Andy and Angela and their family have recently, it's only in Christ that you can face that kind of tragedy. Because he is the one who has given us hope that conquers death, that surpasses it for you and I. And yet my morning started yesterday before all those notifications with a text from a friend here at church. And he sent me a passage from Charles Spurgeon's devotional morning and evenings. And he won't mind me sharing it because Charles Spurgeon wrote it and he sent it to me. So <laughs> I'm going to share it with you. And I want you to think of this perspective. It comes from 2 Corinthians 4.18 and it says the things which are not seen. Listen carefully. In our Christian pilgrimage, it is well for the most part, to be looking forward. Forward lies the crown and onward is the goal. Whether it be for hope, for joy, for consolation, before the inspiring of our love, the future must, after all, be the grand object of the eye of faith. Looking into the future, we see sin cast out. The body of sin and death destroyed. The soul made perfect and fit to be a partaker of the inheritance of the saints in light. Looking further yet, the believer's enlightened eye can see death's river past, the gloomy stream forded, and the hills of light attained on which standeth the celestial city. He seeth himself enter within the pearly gates, hailed as more than a conqueror, crowned by the hand of Christ, embraced in the arms of Jesus, glorified with him, and made to sit together with him on his throne, even as he himself has overcome and sat down with the Father on his throne." The thought of this future may well relieve the darkness of the past and the gloom of the present. The joys of heaven will surely compensate for the sorrows of earth. Hush my fears. This world, this world is but a narrow span, and thou shalt soon have passed it. Hush, hush my doubts. Death is but a narrow stream, and thou shalt soon have forded it. Time, how short. Eternity, how long. Death, how brief. Immortality, how endless. The road is so, so short. I shall soon be there. That is a profound description of our salvation. 
of being welcomed into God's holy presence in his celestial city, of being crowned more than a conqueror and sitting down on the throne with Christ. These are all the things that our hope is about. And faith by nature is hopeful. Someone who has faith in Jesus is not to be hopeless. It is absolutely opposite to the nature of our faith. We above all people should be filled with hope for our Savior is still living and is alive and rules as we speak. And so no matter what death stream brings our way, we can pass it. We can go across it. And we can realize that heaven's shore is awaiting us. It is God's grace that enables us not to be overcome by death or the fear of it. It's fascinating that this earthly road seems so long, and yet it really is, in light of eternity, extremely short. Our time is short, whether you live a few days or you live almost a century or more. This time, one day, will look very, very short. Remember how long high school seemed? Four long years. You look back on it and you're like, what? I don't even remember high school. Now, some of you, there's a reason why. <laughs> but the reality is, as things go by and it, while we're in it, we don't think it's going to ever pass. And then it's gone before we know it. Raising children, does it go fast? I'm hearing it does. <laughs> it does. And now I'm at the age where I'm like, I don't want it to go faster. It's gone too quick. Would you just grow up? No, oh, wait, wait, stop. I take that back. <laughs> and the reality is, is time is slipping more and more. And yet, in this world where everything we love seems to slip away before we know it, our storytellers, our movie makers, like to tell stories about hope. They like to manufacture and create a storyline that gives some semblance of hope to the viewer. What's fascinating is all of these great stories of hope have something in common. They all promise some sort of hero. Somebody who is willing to sacrifice themselves for others, to maybe even die for others, to face evil and conquer it. And maybe even conquer death itself. Look back on some of the Star Wars movies if you know them. Anakin Skywalker is one of those hero figures who wanted to save those he loved from death. And he couldn't do it and ended up turning to the dark side and becoming evil. Darth Vader as we know him. If you haven't seen the movies, I just ruined it for you. You're welcome. If you haven't seen the movies, what rock have you been living under? But the reality is, is that Star Wars universe has all kinds of messages of hope. False hope. Counterfeit hope. They try to find hope in Obi-Wan Kenobi, the old Jedi master who Princess Leia thought, you're my only hope. He was her only hope for the future. And yet this hope for the future ends up sacrificing himself at the hands of evil Darth Vader in order to save Luke and his friends. Quite a Christ figure, is it not? Becoming one with the force and kind of overcoming death itself. Sound familiar? And then you have Luke Skywalker, of course. And then you have characters like Aslan in the Chronicles of Narnia. The lion who sacrifices himself for Edmund's sins. And then you've got even E.T. in E.T. the extraterrestrial. Who really ends up kind of dying and coming back. Sound familiar? Then you've got Neo and the Matrix, Superman and Man of Steel. You've got all these fictitious characters promising hope and delivering on none of it. Why is it that we as humans resonate with stories of hope that center on a Savior, Christ figure? Because we know we need a Savior. We long for it. God has hardwired us to need a Savior. And we want to look for him everywhere else but in God's word. Jesus is our only hope. And he brought a new hope to us when he died on the cross and rose again. Hope was born that day. 
everything changed. And Peter is writing to Christians who are not hopeless in this world, but they are hopeful. They have been chosen by God, but they have been exiled. They are strangers in a foreign land, not welcomed in their own homeland any longer. And they are in need of a reminder that Jesus is their only hope. That God has given them a living hope through a living Savior. And that's what we read in this passage today. I covered a whopping one verse of it last week. I will claim that proudly. And hopefully we will cover more today. We're going to read verses 1 through 5. So why don't you stand with me and let's read about this hope that you and I have in Christ. 1 Peter chapter 1. We'll just start with verse 1. But we'll study 2 to 5. Verse 1, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with His blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. That is his introduction. And now he gets to the meat of this letter. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. You can be seated. And so we have... Peter reminding in verses 1 and 2 these original readers of their identity. He wants them to see themselves as elect or chosen exiles. Chosen in Christ to be dispersed throughout the nations for this time. That God allowed difficulty in their life for a reason. And he gives the reasons for his election and the exile they were going through right now. In three different areas. It's for their sanctification, for their obedience, and for their holiness. Three reasons why they are chosen to be exiles. Sanctification, obedience, and holiness. And then in verses 3 through 5, we see the result of God's electing grace. We see that they have a new life, a new hope, and a new future that Peter wants them to cling to. So let's look at this first section together about the reason for their election or being chosen by Christ. He says that they are these elect exiles of the dispersion according to what? What decided that they would be these elect exiles? The foreknowledge of God the Father. As we saw last week, that foreknowledge means God's designed decree. His predetermined plan that they would be in this situation and condition and have this identity in Christ. That he chose them, as Ephesians 1 says, in Christ before the foundation of the world to be what? It says holy and blameless before him. And then it says in love, he predestined us to adoption as sons. That he chose us, predestined us to adoption before we were ever made. Before the world ever existed, God chose that you would be his, is what Peter is reminding them of. And that this identity of being chosen, they weren't to question it or argue with it. It was meant to give them comfort and hope that their salvation was not based on their choosing, but God's choosing. Because we're fickle. We screw up in our choices. We choose the wrong thing oftentimes, but God always chooses what's best and right. And he chose you and I for his good and right purposes. But here we see the primary reason of him choosing you and I is this thing called sanctification of the spirit. You can break up the Christian life into three categories. It starts with justification. Then you have the process of sanctification, which then results in glorification when we go on and we pass death's stream and we're in eternal life with Christ. You see, many focus on justification, the act of being made right or justified with God through the forgiveness of sins by faith in Christ. That is what gets you in the door. That's what adopts you as sons and daughters into the kingdom. And we focus on that as salvation and we neglect what then happens after. 
we've believed in Christ, after we've been born again and drawn to faith, what happens next? Does the rest of our life matter? Or does it just matter that you have a ticket to heaven? No, it absolutely matters because he didn't just save you to be justified. He saved you to sanctify you. Hagiazo in the Greek actually means to make you morally pure and holy. And that is the process by which we live out our faith in obedience to the Lord, where his Holy Spirit is making us more and more like him. The problem many of us have is we don't want to be more like him. We want to be more like those we follow on social media. We want to be more like the popular, powerful, prestigious people we see in the media. And live the way they live and the luxury they flaunt. Rather than to be like Christ. And here's the reality. If we truly understood our depravity and our sinful nature. And the damage it causes to those around us and our relationships. We would hate sin. And not want anything to do with it. But we get tricked and deceived by our own desires. And we think, well, this isn't really going to be bad for me. And God's word declares otherwise. We should hunger and thirst for righteousness, not for sin and wickedness, right? That we are not satisfied when we pursue sin, but we find satisfaction when we pursue righteousness. So God's desire is that he would sanctify you. And here's the reality. You can't sanctify yourself. It's like a little kid playing in the mud trying to clean themselves up after. Doesn't work. They need mom and dad, right? We need our heavenly father to clean us up when we've made a mess of our life. And have we all made a mess of our lives? If you haven't, you haven't lived long enough yet. But I guarantee we all have. And we all reminded of those things. We know the harsh consequences of disobeying him. But not only are we to be sanctified in the spirit, 1 Peter 1.16 says, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. That's in this letter. Peter is writing about hope, the importance of obedience, and how we are to be holy. And so holiness is not an option for those who want to be an overachiever in the Christian life. Holy is not an option, it's an expectation. God expects you and I to be holy. How do you feel right now? Feel like it's within your grasp? It's not. But he, by his Holy Spirit, sanctifies you in the truth and makes you more and more like him progressively in your life. You should be growing in sanctification. But it's also for the purpose of obedience, it says. That we are to obey him. And oftentimes when you talk about God choosing us unto salvation or the doctrine of election, which I believe in, because I don't argue with God's word, his wording. He chose those words to describe your salvation and mine. We screw up in the definition or explanation of those things. But the reality is, is the doctrine of election is God's doctrine and his teaching. And it says that he chose you because you couldn't choose him. Unless he did something in your life by his Holy Spirit, causing the new birth and causing that to happen. As Peter says in verse three, he caused you to be born again. But the reality we have in this situation is that when we look at our life in him, many people will say, if God chose me and if I'm going to end up being saved in the end, why do I need to obey? He's going to just forgive me. I've heard many people say, well, you know, I'm just going to do it anyways because Jesus is just going to forgive me. Anybody who acts that way doesn't understand sin or what Jesus did for them. That is an abuse of his grace and mercy. I mean, how's that going to work with your kids if you give them a strict command and they go, well, mom and dad are just going to forgive me. I'm going to do it anyways. Is that going to go well in your relationship with them? Why would we think it would go well in our relationship with the Lord if we act the same way? Do you think obedience is important in our family at home? We adopted all five of our kids. We chose them. We chose to love them before we ever knew them. We didn't see pictures and filter through all the cute ones and then pick the cute ones. We just happened to get cute ones. 
<laughs> and, and yet we ended up choosing to love them because God placed them upon our hearts before we ever knew them. And now in their life with us growing up, obedience is absolutely important for their growth in the Lord. And so we are teaching them to obey us that when they become adults, they can obey their heavenly father in heaven. Obedience is an act of thankfulness for the love that you have been shown in Christ. And it's something that is necessary for you and I. Listen to this. 1 Peter 1.22, out of the same chapter, Peter says, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth. Sounds like obedience is kind of important for our purification, right? That it teaches us and causes us to be more like him. What about John 3.36? Turn there with me. This is an important one about obedience. Because oftentimes we hear verses where if we believe in Christ, we will be saved. This is one of those verses. But look at the contrast here that is rather surprising. John 3.36. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Can we stop there for a moment? Can we just celebrate that phenomenal truth? That it is that clear that if you believe in the Son, you have eternal life. We should rest upon that reality. That should quell any fear or doubt or anxiety we have about the future. And that simple, profound, gracious truth. Many people I've talked to after they've lost a loved one, and they say, how do I know that my loved one is with the Lord? My question is, do they believe in the Son? Was that an, a characteristic of their life? Then they have eternal life and you need to rest upon that promise. It's the truth. Now that faith is explained in the rest of this verse. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Now he goes to the opposite. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. So notice the opposite usually of believing is disbelieving. That is not the opposite, biblically speaking. To believe, the opposite is to not obey. The opposite of belief is not disbelief, it's disobedience. A lot of people don't realize that. Our life, if we believe in Christ, should be characterized by obedience to Jesus. That is a faith that matters. That is evidence of a real saving faith. Someone who says, I believe in Christ, but refuses to obey him, knows nothing of salvation. But the wrath of God remains on that person. Because a real faith results in a real change. A life where we seek to obey him. It's not perfection. It's something of direction, of trajectory. What direction or path is your life on? Are you going to disobey the Lord in the future? Sadly, yes. We still wrestle with the sinful nature. None of you will reach perfection in your obedience. None of us. We fail miserably daily, sometimes hourly, correct? But do we repent and continue forward? Do we press on in the hope of our calling that Christ is the one who has saved us and he will bring us to himself? That is the difference between someone who believes and struggles with disobedience and someone who does not believe because they live in disobedience. We are to continue to seek to obey him because we are for the sprinkling with blood. God set you aside to sprinkle you with his blood. That sounds weird. If you grew up in the church, you're like, oh yeah, of course. But if you didn't grow up in the church, you're like, this is weird. But you need to understand what the Old Testament purpose of sprinkling with blood is. Everything God created to worship him. Sin screwed that up. So in the temple worship of Israel, for them to come into God's holy presence, they had to be made holy. All the instruments and tools used in the worship service had to be sprinkled with blood to purify them. So in the Old Testament, the instruments of worship were sprinkled with the blood of the sacrifice. In the New Testament, we are God's instruments of worship sprinkled with the blood of Christ. Thereby, that is what makes us holy. 
Not our personal obedience, but his obedience to the Father and our faith in him has made you and I holy before him. Now look at what Peter says. He says there is a new life, a new hope, and a new future for you and me because of God and his blessedness. He gives a proclamation of praise here that cannot be understated. Or overstated, I should say. He said, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Peter wants you to be worshiping God the Father for what he did through Jesus. And it is summarized in his great act of mercy towards you and I when he decided to cause you to be born again. See, some people overemphasize man's will and man's role in regeneration, meaning being born again. We think that if I do this and I do this, God will cause me to be born again because I did these things. The truth of God's word is that you would never do any of those good things if his Holy Spirit didn't cause you to be born again first. A dead person can't make a good choice, can they? So how can we who are spiritually dead make a spiritually good choice unto salvation? We can't. That's why God uses physical birth as an illustration for your spiritual birth. How many of you were in control of your physical birth? Did you choose the day you were born? Who you were born to or how you were born? You were along for the ride. Spiritually speaking, God is sovereignly working in your life. And so when Peter said God has caused you to be born again, He's saying you and I in our lives were dead in our sins, have rebelled against God, and we're doing our own thing, going in our own way. And then God, in his plan, according to his foreknowledge and will, decided that he would interrupt your life with his grace. That he would intervene at a time when you least expect it. And when you hated Christ or wanted to run away with him, suddenly you found yourself drawn to him. Suddenly you began to understand things about the word you never wanted to understand before. Suddenly Christ became exceedingly more interesting, more beautiful, and then you ended up desiring him more than anything else. That is the new birth at work. That is God's Holy Spirit drawing you to faith in Christ. And it's because of his mercy. You see, mercy is something I haven't always understood, and I don't claim to understand it now. I claim to be learning more about it. We talk about grace often, but we don't talk about mercy. You see, mercy in the Greek means to have pity or compassion or show kindness to somebody. I want you to think about your view of God for a moment. You may not realize it, but we all have unbiblical, untrue views of God. Different season and different times of our life. Oftentimes, the circumstances you're presently facing... You project upon God and his nature and you think God is this way because of that that's happening in my life. So if something unpleasant, bad, or tragic has happened in your life, we project it onto God and say God is not loving, he is not kind, and he does not care for me. Because we don't like the circumstances, we don't like the one who is in charge of those circumstances. And so we view God very, very negatively. And yet, how often do you think of God as being great in mercy towards you? Oftentimes, we view him as the the divine orchestrator of all things who's constantly fed up with us going, would you just suck it up? Quit whining, get over it, get through it, do what you're supposed to do, and stop being who you are and be something different. Yet God's word says he's great in mercy. He has a lot of it and he's good at it. He's compassionate towards your condition. He knows your weaknesses and he's made provision for them. How different would your love and relationship be with the Lord if you saw him as great in mercy and not harsh in justice? He is truly just but he is holy and good in his justice. You, we start to understand some things about mercy. I, when I started to study Reformed theology years ago, I started to grasp it a little more when I realized that God is holy. Because he is holy, he is also good. In order for him to be good, he also has to be just. 
And to be just means that he has to punish all evil that happens. A lot of people think, well, if God is so merciful, can he just forgive everybody no matter what they believe? Just wipe it all away. Every sin that's ever been done, just wipe it away. Well, I like using this example, and I've used it before, but I'm going to use it again. Let's say, hypothetically, the worst horrific thing happened to one of your family members. Something from the movies that you could imagine where they were kidnapped, they were tortured, and they were en- ended up being murdered by that person. The authorities arrest them. All the evidence is there. The person stands trial before the judge. All the evidence is laid bare. They are clearly guilty on all accounts. And the judge looks at that person and says, you know what? I am merciful. You can go free. What would you conclude about that judge who just let that evil person who did that evil deed to your loved one go free without any punishment? You would conclude that that judge is not good, he is not just, and he's actually evil and a participant in the evil that was done because he let it happen. And sometimes we think God is that way. He sees all the evil being done and he just lets it happen to kids, women, men, everybody. It's just happening all over and God is doing nothing about it. If you think that, you need to be reminded who he sent for you and me. He did the exact opposite of nothing. He did everything for you and me. That's Peter's point. God did everything for you because of his great mercy. He caused you to be born again. He sent his son to die for you. And he promises that all the evil ever committed will be punished so that he can be just and good. But how does a just and good God also show mercy when we're the ones who did the evil? That's where Jesus comes in. God chose a substitute. A substitutionary atonement for you and I. That Jesus would come and in our place... All of our evil would be poured out on him and all the wrath we deserve he would experience so that God's justice would be satisfied. Thereby being able to show mercy to the sinners who actually committed it. So you have this amazing story of hope. True story, not fiction, not Hollywood, where God has decided that he was merciful towards sinners like you and me so much that he sent his only son to be our replacement, to satisfy justice so he can show mercy to you and me. So where's the only place in all of human experience where mercy and justice intersect? At the cross. Where God can be just and punish evil and yet show mercy to sinners like you and me. Saving us and making us his own. That's why we have a new life in him. That's why we've been born again to a living hope. Not only to a living hope, but to an inheritance that is what? Imperishable. It doesn't have an expiration date. Ever found expired food? Ever had your kids say, this tastes weird. (laughs) Check the date. Lord, please protect us from being sick. Not that it's ever happened in our home. But there are expiration dates on everything in this world. Everything. Everlasting gobstopper. They don't last forever. Everything has an expiration date. No matter how beautiful your new vehicle is. Leave it alone for six months. It won't run. See it after 20 years. It's going to be rusted. Unless it's all made out of plastic. Then it's just going to be warped from the sun. Whatever it is, everything we value in this life that's a thing, that's a treasure, it's perishable. It's not holy and undefiled. They're they're tainted and they're fading like the U.S. currency. (laughs) It is not what it used to be. The higher the inflation goes, the lower the value. The more money you have in the bank, you leave it alone, the less you have tomorrow. It is fading. And then everybody's like, well, maybe Bitcoin and maybe this and that. Maybe that's stable. Hmm, good luck. 
Because our hope is not in this life. Our treasure, our inheritance is not here. Do you know how many people are counting on an inheritance from a family member? And most of the time what it does, it destroy a family rather than build it. Because our inheritance is not here. God has an inheritance for you and I that is kept in heaven for you. It won't perish. It won't be tainted. It will not fade. It is kept secure. How? By God's power. He is guarding you through faith for that salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. We have a future that cannot be changed. That cannot be taken away from you and I. That whatever happens in this life, it will not touch our inheritance in Christ. He has kept it secure for you and I. So, when the stream of death, when we're faced with crossing it, and death comes our way, what will we hope in? Our ability to cross it or the one who's already crossed it for us? We will trust in the one who has conquered death. Our hope is in a living Savior. We have a living hope, and God has caused us to be born again so we can understand this reality and have great hope for the future because of it. If I were to ask you, what is your only hope? I hope it's not like Princess Leia who put it in a person who ultimately failed in the end. Our only hope is in the one person, Jesus Christ, who conquered death in the grave for us. One of the old catechisms of the historic church, the Heidelberg, asked this first question of all those who are growing in Christ. And it's, what is your only comfort in life and in death? It's the same thing as saying, what's your hope for the future? What's your only comfort in life and death? It's this, that I am not my own, but belong body and soul in life and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. Listen to what he's done. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood. And he has set me free from the tyranny of the devil. He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for my salvation. Because I belong to him, Christ, by his Holy Spirit, assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. That is our only hope and comfort in life and in death, that we do not belong to ourselves, but to him who has purchased us with his blood. That's who we belong to. That's why we have this hope. And yet today, many people are ruled by fear and the fear of death. I don't care how you think about the pandemic and all the sickness and everything else that's gone on over the last couple years, but we can all agree that people are ruled by fear of death more now than recent future. It is consuming people. And that is the last thing God wants of you and I, to be ruled by a fear of death, by a fear of a virus, no matter how bad it could be or not be. That should not rule your life and determine how you live out your faith. We are to trust our days to him because he has every day written and nothing is going to prevent you from living those days out to their full. God has a hope and a future for you and I. And it is in Jesus and not in our own will. It is for his purposes and not ours. And we need to be ready to walk that out on a daily basis with a new life, a new hope, and a new future kept secure in him. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this new hope that we have in you. That when Jesus rose from the dead, our hope rose with him. That our hope didn't stay there, but Lord, you exalted your son to your right hand. And that is where our hope sits and rules and reigns. Jesus, you are our only hope. And I pray that you would fill each person here today with great hope for the future. That it's not just some blind belief that everything will work out. That's what the Star Wars idea of hope is. A blind belief that everything works out in the end. That is not our hope or our belief. Our hope is that our God controls and designs and planned all things. And all things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. That is the hope we have. Hope in Jesus and how things will turn out for us because of him.
And so, Lord, fill us with great hope today as we renew our faith in you at your table, celebrating your broken body and your shed blood. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. What can wash away my sin? Heavenly Father, we pray that you would prepare our hearts for this time. Lord, we confess our sins to you, and maybe we haven't done that in a while. But Lord, I pray that you would forgive us of all our sins, all the ways, Lord, where we've disobeyed you, where we've broken your holy commands and brought down upon ourselves the deserving of wrath. But we thank you, Jesus, that you are great in mercy that you are kind and compassionate towards us, that Jesus, you died in our place, that we might receive grace and forgiveness. And so, Lord, we thank you, and we are reminded of your broken body on the cross and your shed blood by which we are forgiven of all our sins. Renew our faith and our ability, Lord, to walk in this new life and this living hope you've given us. May we take great joy in the hope we have in the future that you have planned for us. And may every one of Satan's lies and discouragements fall ineffective upon our ears and minds today. We thank you, Lord, for your love, for your grace, and your great mercy. In Jesus' name. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us take it together. In the same way also he took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's take it together. Would you stand with me for the blessing? Do not put your hope in this life or the things of this life or even other people. But put your hope in Jesus Christ and Him alone. Hope in Him does not disappoint. It does not put us to shame. Hoping in other things, the Bible says, is vain hope. Hope that has no value in the end. But hope in Jesus is of exceedingly great value. It is immeasurable what hope in Christ will do for you in the end. You will not be disappointed if you trust in Christ in this life. You above all people will know the joy of the salvation he has for you and the inheritance he is keeping secure for you. So walk this week in hope and in faith knowing that God has planned out your week. God has given you the grace needed for whatever comes tomorrow, but he told you don't worry about tomorrow. All you can do is handle what is coming at you today. So rejoice in the fact that some of those things you worry about are not happening today. They could happen tomorrow, and He will help you through them if they do. But for today, they are not happening. 
So trust in Him, rejoice in Him, and look forward in hope to what He has for you. Amen? Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord turn His face towards you and give you peace. God bless you guys. Thanks for coming.